give a, a talk about some of the work that I do at the universities, um, and it's going to be a little bit data heavy, I'm afraid. I've intended to put as many attractive photos of hoverflies in as possible. Um, let's see if I do this. Um, so I, I, I apologize. Mic's off. There we go. Yeah. And now we're getting feedback. It is. As as that that sounds okay. Is that okay? Can they can they hear me now? Right. Okay. Right. Sorry. It's all right. Just to recap for those online. Um, very briefly, I'm going to be talking about distributional and phenological changes, and I'll quickly define what I mean by those. When we think about distributional changes, we think about range shifts. And so we might take, for example, biological recording data, which is what I'm going to be using today. And we look in a certain time period where the species was found, where that northern range margin might be. And we look a few years later at a similar set of data to establish what that range shift has been under that period. So we're looking for the change in the range margin. Um, in this case, uh, the northern range margin. But we can also look, because citizen science in the UK has such a wealth of data, we can look at the timing of life histories as well. And that can be done using, for example, the springtime phenology. So if we think on this graph here, sorry, I'll point to this for the, for the folk at home. If we think about this flight distribution here, distribution of dates through time, we can take this leading edge of the flight period, so our springtime phenology, and we can track how that flight date changes with temperature or through time. Um, this is an example from uh, a damselfly, the large red damselfly, which I've done a little bit more work on, um, but the, the patterns are very similar in a lot of different species. So th the first question that I want to ask then is, where do the dipteras sit within the wider response that the UK fauna are showing? And because of this enormous wealth of citizen science data that we have for different taxa within the UK, we can address this sort of question looking not only at the diptera, but also at a variety of vertebrates, a variety of non-insect invertebrates, and then a whole host of really well-recorded insect groups as well. And we can, we can try to predict what we might see if these species are all tracking climate change as we'd expect based on the temperature change that they're experiencing. So I'm, I'm going to show you some, some graphs and I'll, first of all I'll walk you through what we would predict to see if these species were tracking climate. 
So we would expect with our phenology shift to be to see a, a negative shift that is species occurring earlier in the year. So that that change is negative through time. And so we'd expect our species to be occupying this kind of part of the graph. And here on the left, you'll see lots of different taxa. This, the number here is the number of species in each taxa. And you'll see that the diptera have a, a pretty good representation, the majority being uh, the surfids, the hoverflies. So if we look at what that, that response looks like across all of these groups, we'd expect it all to fall in that green side of the graph. And it's a little bit noisier than that, uh, which is which is interesting, not entirely unpredicted. Um, it's a very rapid phase of climate change. There's some patterns that are, that, are, that are quite visible. First of all, our vertebrates are all over the shop. Um, they are relatively poorly recorded. They are relatively constrained by their habitats. They're relatively small in population size, and so they're not responding in a concerted way. Um, some of the less well-recorded non-insect inverts as well are a little bit all over the place, but the insects for the most part, and in particular the diptera here, are responding extremely strongly in the direction we'd expect. So for the phenological change, the insects in particular and the, the diptera within the insects are responding very strongly and interestingly very consistently in terms of their timing during the year. We can do this for distributional changes as well. So we would predict a positive range shift that would be moving north in the country. Um, again, same kind of format for the graph and a similar kind of pattern. So our vertebrates are a little bit all over the shop, uh, some responding, some moving north, some seeming to lose range size through time. But again, our well-recorded insects here uh, flying the flag for a biological response to climate change. And again, our diptera showing this very strong, very consistent poleward shift in their distributions. Now, if we think about what a species needs to do to react to climate change, it doesn't need to do both of these two things. It can shift in time to find the right sort of temperatures for its, its preferred physiology, or it can shift in space. Either one of those two adaptations may help it to persist in the long term. And so we, we can think about a, a sort of a, a bivariate plot where in the top left corner, we've got this negative phenological shift and a, a positive range shift moving north. So responding in both dimensions, we can be responding in one or the other, or hopefully not many in that bottom right hand corner. And if we look at where these different taxes that I've talked about fall in this plot, it's not quite as positive as we might hope. Uh, we certainly have a lot of the vertebrates uh, occupying this, this negative range shift and variable phenological shift space here. But when we look in this top left corner, the diptera in particular are really the standard bearers again. Um, they're showing this really strong, really consistent, as predicted response to climate change. So maybe what we've got here is evidence that within the UK fauna, the diptera are particularly resilient to environmental change. So to sum that up, laying, laying some of the groundwork for the, for the later part of the talk, Diptera are really doing very well in terms of responding to climate. This is obviously looking at quite large scales and across the whole community. So I'm not talking about the conservation of particular taxa, particular species. They're also showing very rapid responses, uh, sometimes outpacing climate change in terms of their poleward range shifts and the advance in their springtime phenology. OK, so that's the big picture. What about the hoverflies in particular, where we have really good data, not only about their distributions, but about their traits and their, their fundamental biology as well. Um, so the, the, the wonderful hoverfly recording scheme has enormous amounts of data associated with it now. And even going back to the 1960s and 70s, this is a reasonable number of, of records per year that we can use to look back in time. And over this period of growth in the scheme, we've seen a fairly rapid increase in environmental temperature as well. So it's a good case study for examining environmental change more generally. And what we can do is take all of the hoverflies that we have data for and ask ourselves, how are they responding in terms of their phenology? And I'll just focus on phenology for, for this part of the talk. Um, just quickly, what I'll show you is the amount of data we have for different species. So here, each bar is a different species within the hoverfly data set. And you see we have a, a lot of species represented in these data. Um, I've, I've capped it at a minimum of 20 years of data across the, the recording, um, but some of them have up to 50 years. And what you can see here is if each bar is a species, the more data you have, the more consistent and the stronger the response in terms of phenology. So the species about which we know the most, we detect the strongest responses to climate change in their phenology. And this is looking at the leading edge of the flight period here. So their, their springtime 
emergence phenology. Now, what we might expect if we're seeing a response in the springtime phenology is that this whole rain, this whole distribution of flight dates would shift earlier in the year. However, the citizen science data don't suggest that that's happening. If we look at the center of the flight period, so this, this uh, median flight date right in the middle, we see a much more mixed picture here where some species are responding, many species are not, and the overall average is about half the rate of that springtime phenology. So what we seem to be seeing then is an elongation of the flight period. So it's getting earlier in the year, but not necessarily shifting in the center. And the picture is even less clear when we look at that trailing edge of the flight period. So when we look at the, the autumnal or late summer records, those don't seem to be shifting at all. So more evidence for this elongation of the flight period, more insects generally during the year rather than the whole flight period shifting earlier. So that's the insights that we can get from the hoverfly recording scheme, which is a relatively ad hoc citizen science scheme where people submit records uh, as they see them. Um, however, the hoverflies are particularly well recorded, and so we have some really good standardized data sets as well. And I've, I've been lucky enough to work a little bit with uh, Jennifer Owen's data. Uh, Jennifer passed away just as we were about to publish a paper. She's a, a co-author on the publication and the publication is uh, dedicated to her. But um, and sadly, I never got to meet her. But her, I mean, obviously, her data and the effort that she put in uh, building this enormous data set about biodiversity in her garden is a real treasure trove for precisely this kind of analysis. So I'm, I'm going to show you what Jennifer found when we looked at her data for the same kind of question using just her garden data. And it's an interesting comparison because that leading edge of the flight period shows a really similar pattern, um, almost to, to certainly to within a day in terms of the rate of shift of the species that she was recording. However, what she finds is that the middle of the flight period and the end of the flight period are shifting in a really concerted way as well. So maybe there's some evidence that the hoverfly recording scheme in these citizen science schemes, they marry up to standardized recording in some cases, but there's areas where perhaps they're not, not matching the, the standardized uh, recording uh, quite as well in others. And I can discuss reasons why that may or may not be. However, one of the, the great things about working with surfids, as I'm, I'm sure many of you know, is that we understand a huge amount about their biology. And so we can take some of these these patterns where some species seem to be responding more strongly than others, some not responding at all. And we can try to explain why that might be based on the fundamental biology of the species that we're looking at. Um, this was a bit of a, a, a data trawl for me, learning some very, very rudimentary Mandarin, Russian, my, brushing up on my GCSE German, to try to trawl through the old literature on surfid biology collected as part of uh, pest control and pollination, fundamental biology studies. And building up a, a traits database, uh, complementing um, the SurfNet Martin Spates database on traits uh, to try to understand how the thermal biology of different species might influence their response to climate. And so uh, an example from the Chinese literature on the left um, and on the right is uh, one of the synthesis plots where we can show how the rearing temperature influences the development rate of these nine different species, for example. And when we look at the rate of response of the different species that we have in our data set, we can compare that against some traits and we see some patterns emerging. On the left here, you can see that the, the strength of the phenological response. So on the, at the bottom here, this is a stronger response getting earlier in the year. Up on the top here, this is no response at all. Seems to be stronger when the pupil development rate is very slow. So if you are a, a hoverfly that has a long pupil, develop, pupil period, then you are more sensitive to climate, which you might expect if we're responding very quickly. If the pupil, uh, pupil period is very short, it doesn't really matter how warm it is. You ping through that period, you're out the other side before you've noticed what the environmental temperature is. So an interesting way that we might be able to predict different species and how they might be different vary in sensitivity. The species that are responding most strongly also seem to be those that have the most generations per year. Um, so particularly these warm adapted species that are able to come into the UK from the European continent, rapidly move through their generations and therefore take advantage of those warmer springtime temperatures. So we have some traits that we can use to explain the heterogeneity in the data set as well. So just to conclude from that, then the hoverflies are certainly showing very, very strong responses to, to global warming in terms of their phenology. 
The community patterns, however, when we look at the, the group as a whole, seem to vary depending on the data sets that we use. And there's some important areas that I think we need to, to look at in order to, to get the most out of all of these different data sets. And importantly, we can start to predict what species are responding and what aren't by thinking about both their thermal biology, so their development rate and how that varies in response to temperature, but also the more, the more macroecological patterns like their, their generation times and voltiness. So I, I promised that I, I'd talk a little bit about mimicry as well, and this is where I first got interested in surfeits, not necessarily in their responses to climate, but in their deep evolutionary history, and in particular their, their links with the stinging hymenoptera. Um, so some of my, my favourite hoverfly mimics uh, here, and I, I know that there's some interest in volucella zonaria in terms of global change and species as well, and as I started thinking about uh, ecological change and the climate, I realized that you can combine the mimicry aspects of the biology of these, this group with their ecological change as well. And I, I'll explain briefly where, where that sort of approach comes from. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, um, I'm talking mostly about Batesian mimicry here, so named after Henry Walter Bates. And in a Batesian mimicry system, you have a, a prey item who is defended in some way. So this might be one of our stinging wasps or bees uh, here. And you also have an organism that has evolved to resemble the defended prey item. So in this case, our hoverfly. The idea being that our predator here learns to avoid our stinging bee and thereby also avoids the harmless, uh, harmless mimic here um, that has evolved to resemble it. Now, if you think through the, the sequence of events that has to happen for this, this uh, phenomenon to work evolutionarily, you need the predator to encounter the defended model first. They need to be educated as to what color patterns to avoid, otherwise they'll get stung. And so we have this model first scenario where through the season, we'd like to have our bees coming out and educating our fledgling birds. And then the mimic can come along and it can benefit from that learned avoidance. So the model teaches more quickly if it's not being encumbered by this mimic that looks like it. The predator learns more quickly so it doesn't get stung, it doesn't get as confused. The mimic benefits more quickly because it encounters this educated suite of predators who are just going to leave it alone. But what if under climate change, we have a system where our mimics, our hoverflies, are shifting their phenology very quickly? As I've just shown you, they are. This is a problem because a lot of these stinging bees and wasps are social animals that live in nests and they are buffered to a certain extent by that particular way of living from environmental temperature change. So we have a potential situation where our mimics might be jumping the gun in, a, in an ecological sense, getting out in front of their models and disrupting this millions of years old evolutionary system. And that's the sort of pattern that we, we start to see emerging when we look at model mimic pairs of stinging hymenoptera and their Batesian hoverfly mimics. When we pair those species up and we look at which one comes first in the year, as you trace through the citizen science data, we're seeing this gradual trend where the hoverfly shift in phenology is manifesting as more and more mimic first model pairs. So a potential problem here. And I won't talk to you about the, the psychological experiments that we've been doing now, but we've been doing some work using, using humans as a model system to understand how people cognitively try to learn to, diso to differentiate between the different insect types. And we've shown that there's a significant fitness consequence, negative fitness consequence for all three participants in this relationship when we have uh, environmental change driving these kinds of patterns. It gets even more complex because, of course, we can incorporate the distributional change as well. Now, if you are a flycatcher in the south, you've got a lot of species to cope with in the UK, even more so if you go to more species rich areas on the continent or in the tropics. And so any kind of decision making that you're trying to do is going to be complicated by these various model mimic pairs, these extensive mimicry networks, really. However, if you're in the north, you've got a relatively simple cognitive task. You only have to differentiate between a small number of stinging animals and harmless animals. So maybe you can exploit your, your, uh, your prey more effectively. 
Now, as we, so there'll, there'll be a suite of birds that's doing really well up north. Now, as you, this is a, a very, very messy plot, but uh, just to walk you through it, we've got surface species richness through the UK, so from uh, the Isles of Scilly at zero up to northern Scotland um, at around a thousand kilometres in north things on the British National Grid. And we've got our Hymenopteran species richness as well, and you can see they drop off reasonably quickly as you go further north, as you might expect. But as I've shown you, the hoverflies are going to be moving north very quickly, as are the singing Hymenoptera. And so we're going to get an increase in the, the species richness of these mimicry communities as we move further north under climate change. Um, and what that means, don't worry too much about what this plot looks like, but it, the, the yellow here at the bottom around London in the southeast is a really dense mimicry network with lots and lots of species, very rich, huge cognitive load for the predators to try to understand how they're going to differentiate between their harmless prey and stinging prey. Up in the north of Scotland, easy, piece of cake. But climate change is going to make that a lot more difficult for them. And the really interesting thing is here that ecological change under climate, therefore, is going to make for much more dynamic evolutionary systems that the, predator, the, the predators and the prey are going to have to respond to. So to sum up that third part then, the, the ecological changes that I've been talking about and that we're very familiar with have other consequences in an evolutionary sense. Um, the changing phenology and distributions are going to make this dynamic landscape for the predators and the two different types of prey item to interact with, which is a fascinating opportunity to study study phenomena that are usually only studied over in, in retrospect uh, through deep time in almost real time, in ecological time over a period of years or decades. So the, the Diptera then, just to sum up everything that I've been saying. But responding really quickly, a fantastic system for studying environmental change and a candidate barometer, really, both in terms of their phenology and distributions for how climate change is going to impact the wider British fauna. Um, we know a little bit now about how their traits might influence species specific responses, both in terms of dis distributions and phenology. Um, we also know that their long standing evolutionary relationships with other taxa might be under strain or perhaps strengthened by these shifting distributions of phenology as well. Um, but what we see for the most part is that climate change is likely to be a net positive at a community level for the diptera, mm -hmm. just because we're getting an immigration, an increase in species richness on the whole across the UK. Now that's not to say it's going to be a good thing full stop, um, but if we're thinking purely about diversity and richness, then we're likely to see a substantial in increase over the not too distant future, apart from our poor, northerly distributed species who are likely to get squeezed out. So I, I just wanted to end as well by, by saying that there are there are projects on ongoing at the moment as part of the, the Druid project, which is a big insect clients project uh, held hosted at Leeds, but also featuring, I think, the NHM and various other partners um, to try to shore up our knowledge of how species are responding. Um, we, we're currently building a citizen science portal for people to test some of the models that we have to predict species distributions. We've done this for the Odonata, for the dragonflies, we're doing it for the Orthoptera very shortly. I'm hoping hoverflies are going to be in the pipeline and I just wanted to flag this to you because I might be sending something out in the next couple of months to, to invite those of you with really the, the fantastic knowledge that you have about this particular group um, to, to help us fix, improve the sorts of data-driven approaches that we use for some of this climate change prediction work. Um, and with that, I, I mean, I, I couldn't end without thanking all of the recording schemes, the fantastic recorders that put so much of their time into, into these schemes, and in particular, um, the, the Hoverfly recording scheme um, from which I've, I've drawn so much for the, the data from this talk. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Right, we've got uh, a mobile microphone, so we can. All right, so we're going to hand this to the people in the audience here if they've got a question. And um, I have said that um, the people at home can put questions in the chat. So we're going to give it a go, see how it go see how it goes. Hello, can you hear? I hope you can hear this at home. Anyone got a question? <laughs> <laughs> no one's got any questions. Richard, no one has. <laughs>
Uh, hi, uh, thanks for a terrific talk and some lovely data. Um, how much is the inconsistency in the data, the way in which people record things over time, affecting your your variance in in and, and your conclusions? Yeah, that that's at least two or three talks in and of itself. Um, so that I, I've done quite a bit of work on on accounting for recorder effort over through time, recorder bias. People tend to record at the weekend. Um, and so technically the resolution is probably not daily, it's probably five, six, seven days. Um, what we what we do in the in the broader sense is try to look at the big picture and use the the, the larger data sets that might have those those issues with them. We can adapt of adopt a various various different approaches. If I go back to the beginning of the slides, and sorry Zoe, you'll have to scroll through my entire presentation just to get to the next talk, but I'll show you. For the range shifts, for example, we can either take that northernmost record, which is very noisy, depending on who's visited which sites, or we can take the average of the top 10 most northerly grid cells. So that's a little bit, that's a way of softening the variability. We can also, if we have far more records in the second period, subsample so that we have a sample size that's the same as for the first period, and we randomly subsample within 100 kilometer grid cells to account for the variability. And there's a suite of other techniques that are very similar and they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think what we can say is that the general the general findings of these kinds of analyses are robust. The details are a little bit subject to that kind of variability. But yeah, good question. I imagine what's happening to account for the data is that the the flies are dispersing north, south, east and west, and then you've got differential survival. And of course, every stage of the insect is affected. So it's a really complicated situation, isn't it? Um, you know, um, I could say, well, what about the predation of the larvae? Perhaps it's the predator of the larvae that's increasing in populate and so on. <laughs> you need to apply Occam's razor pretty <laughs> strictly. <laughs> Um, very difficult, isn't it? But super stuff, yeah. It, it is, yeah. J just briefly on that. So I mean, the heterogeneity in the data is one thing, but yes, the diversity of different species that you have within the flies and the different life histories, and it makes it very difficult to say that the diptera are doing X. Um, obviously, you've got some species, in, even in the hoverflies, that are obligate paras parasites of social insect nests, and so they're entirely reliant upon those insects. They can't move anywhere unless those hosts are there. Um, you've got a whole set of, as you say, very different life history stages within a species that have different different requirements. Um, what I've tried to do is pull out the big picture. Um, and I, I think there's a fascinating amount of traits based work to be done still on the hoverflies, despite the fact that we've been doing this for 30 years, 40 years um, to, to unpick some of those some of those patterns, certainly. Yeah, and I, yeah, I didn't talk about it. We it's very easy when I just when I do lay talks about this to the general public, I tend to say, oh, they're shifting range and everyone thinks, oh, well, the fly flies from there to there and it's a range shift. But of course, it's not. It's a complex meta population process, exactly as you say, where this population is more likely to go extinct now than that population. And so you get this general general mass movement. Yeah. OK, I think that's it for questions in the audience. So thanks, Chris. Um, for the, did you see any sort of fine grain data on differences between, following on from what's just been said about those those surfaces that have aquatic larvae, okay, can, compared with non-aquatics and how, the, how much the aquatic story is affected by climate change as we see it in the UK? That's a really good question. And given the fact that my PhD was on dragonflies in responses to climate change, I should have looked at this in more detail already, but I haven't. But it, it'd be really interesting to see whether the, the area star lines, for example, are, are responding in a different way. Now, the work that I did on dragonflies back in the early 2000s showed that the aquatic environment doesn't seem to buffer responses to climate. So the species in the aquatic environment, the, the aquatic odonate nymphs, are going through their phenological patterns in much the same way as terrestrial. Uh, terrestrial insect groups and birds and plants, in fact, as well. There's a fairly consistent shift. So a priori, based on that, I'd expect that there wasn't much of an impact of aquatic versus terrestrial life histories, but it's not something I've looked at specifically. OK, anyone else with a question in the audience? No? <laughs> um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm aware that your colleagues are calculating range changes for butterflies and moths. You know, there's great loads of data there. So yeah. how does the, the diptera, especially the hoverflies, compare to those rates of change when they're, they're, they're caterpillars obviously feeding on plants, whereas the hoverflies, a whole range of life histories? Yeah, that's, um, I, so my, well, I, I can refer you back to my citizen science approach to studying those sorts of questions, which is based on these kinds of plots. But it, this, you'll notice the Lepidoptera are missing because the butterfly monitoring scheme, are, it's a different type of data that didn't really fit with this kind of analysis. Um, I couldn't speak to the exact differences between them. The Diptera, Odonates, you see the Hymenoptera up here as well, the Neuroptera. Um, the, the Orthoptera in some cases are responding in a similar way, and I think it's quite similar in the butterflies as a whole. I think we have a lot more heterogeneity in the butterfly responses though. My, my feeling is that the flies are reasonably consistent and the butterflies are a bit all over the place despite the trait heterogeneity in the, in the diptera. But I, that's something I, I couldn't speak to immediately. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. That was great.